Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, thank you all for attending today's live talk with Professor Salman Sayyid. Um, today's talk is going to be about generally the project of critical Muslim studies, uh, specifically the Islamicate and decoloniality. Um, so a little bit about our guest speaker. Um, Dr. Sayed currently holds uh, the chair in rhetoric and decolonial thought at the University of Leeds. Um, he was one of the, the first people to introduce the idea of critical Muslim studies uh, through several of his own publications, especially a very rich and impressive journal, Reorient uh, uh, Blind Peer Review Journal. Um, I highly recommend those of you to, who are interested in his work to look at some of the publications in Reorient. Um, it also has a podcast um, and uh, many other interesting uh, parts of, of that journal. Um, he's written two uh, formative texts. I think one that's very well known and offsided is called A Fundamental Fear, a Eurocentrism and the Emergence of Islamism. So the idea that um, Eurocentrism was itself uh, something that created and formulated a kind of modern Islamism. Um, and I'll actually informed my own work very much on Kemalism in Turkey. Uh, that was published in 1997. And more recently, although uh, not so much, I guess 2014 was recalling the Caliphate. And that itself has been public, uh, translated into almost half a dozen languages. Um, so we're going to give the, the floor to Dr. Said, who's going to talk about um, what uh, decoloniality means in relation to Islam, the discourses around it, power and, and knowledge formation, um, and what that has to do in our world today. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Said. Thank you very much. And I really am um, very happy to be here and I appreciate this chance to talk about some of these things. Um, let me start off with a, um, some recent events, um, which is to do with the idea that Islam is in crisis. I say recent events because some of you may know that it's only a few weeks ago that the president of France um, talked about how Islam was in crisis. And in a way this is recent, but in another way, it's actually something which has been ongoing for many, many, many decades. Um, every now and then, um, a journal or a politician or some publication will come out and talk about the crisis of Islam. So I want to talk a little bit about what is this thing that we talk about the crisis of Islam. So on one hand, the idea of the crisis of Islam is basically um, that there is something wrong with Islam, which leads to extremism and violence and terrorism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's one aspect of Islam. But the other aspect, which you might want to see in the next slide, is um, I can't actually control it. So if you go to slide number two, that's it. So there's another crisis. Uh, if you look at from kind of um, Muslims in Burma, um, you look at the kind of genocide, which is sort of ongoing, even though it's not on our television screens, to see the treatment of Muslims in China, where we have basically kind of the recon reconstruction of concentration camps, um, you know, with through possibly with 3 million people in, 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 in there, um, and being forced to do all sorts of things, and three million Muslims who are being asked to renounce their Muslimness in different ways. You can see in India, not just in Kashmir, uh, similar kind of position with this uh, violence against Muslims, almost a kind of a rearticulation of a kind of a um, Jim Crow with Muslims being lynched, uh, et cetera, being attacked, um, Palestine, all of these places, and you can add to this list even a bigger list if you wanted to. And then what's happening, the new law of separatism, which was um, proposed by the French uh, president as a way of dealing with the crisis of Islam. So there seems to be two sides to this crisis. 
and, um, and that's kind of um, interesting in itself. So why are there two sides to crisis? So what is the crisis of Islam? Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so what I want to really talk about is um, when people say Islam is in crisis, what is the thing that is in crisis? In other words, what is Islam? Well, easiest way to talk about Islam, and often Muslims do this, would say, well, Islam means deen, deen means religion. And that's, so Islam is a religion. Um, but the problem is this, that and I'll try and show, if you look at the first translations, first English translations of the Quran, where the word or deen appeared, they didn't have the category religion. It wasn't religion that was being used. They would use, translations would use something like sacred law rather than religion. And the reason is this, that when the first translations of the Quran appeared, um, there was no idea of religion. Religion wasn't really a category. And since then, the concept of religion grew up describing a particular idea of Christianity. So ultimately, all religions were really proper religions were was Christianity or Western Christianity in particular. And all the other kind of customs and traditions and things like that, which we now call religion and um, were kind of defective. So at the best, uh, Islam could only be a defective religion because it's not really like Christianity. And that would apply to Judaism, it would apply to Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. Because religion, the idea of what religion was, was uh, based on what the idea of Christianity is, when we think of Islam and we say it's a religion, we're already engaged in a certain kind of distortion. We're already asking certain kinds of questions from it, and we're already expecting to certain kinds of answers. Now, that's one of the problems that we have in relation to the understanding of this crisis of Islam. Because we think Islam is a religion and religions are Christian. And how do we know that Islam is in crisis? Because Islam doesn't behave, act as Christianity is supposed to behave, etc. Can we go to the next slide, please? Is there the next? Yeah, okay. So let me just uh, pause for a minute here and just try and explain what I'm trying to say. The category of religion, the concept of religion, which we use in everyday language quite unproblematically, um, it has a particular history it is used to do certain types of work. And its history is part of the kind of knowledge um, inheritance that we all work with. So this knowledge um, really draws the idea of the world, understanding of the world. And it goes from kind of Plato to NATO in a way that there are six, um, Real knowledge begins with the ancient Greeks and you can sort of watch its different stages until you get to the present. So there's this kind of sequence on that. And in that real knowledge, which is basically the experience of Europe becomes the dominant way of understanding the world. And this presents a challenge for those traditions and cultures and societies and histories which have a complicated relationship with Europe, which cannot be considered to be European because Europe defined itself in contrast to them. Europe said what it is, is what these other things are not. So this is one of the kind of challenges there. What do the knowledges which are outside Europe how do those knowledges, how do those histories, how do those traditions, how do we understand them? What part do they play in the world? So Eurocentric knowledge then isn't just simply knowledge which is um, created by Europeans and with all deference to people in North America and the audience here, 
when I say Europe, I'm not talking about the European Union. I'm talking about a way of um, I'm talking about a way of uh, a way of life, uh, a, a cultural formation which is transatlantic. So North America in its hegemonic formation is also part of that European inheritance. Hence. You know, there may not be any um, ancient Greeks in Washington, D.C., but there certainly is where a NATO lies. So that's part of the sequence. So Eurocentric knowledge really isn't, um, it includes the North American contribution to it. Okay, so can we go to the next slide? I want you to, if you look at these two maps, you'll see immediately the impact of categories of understanding. These are two world maps. Yeah? Map A is the Mercator projection. It's the one which is most often used in, used to use the high schools, which was used earlier on. Um, it has, and you will notice something immediately from that. That map, makes, for example, Greenland almost big as Africa. Africa. It makes England much bigger than big as India. The distortions that it carries out, compare that to map B, in which you see uh, how big Africa really is compared to um, Greenland. Now, the reason why I'm talking about this map is because if you think about it, all of us, understand the world and how even the continents, etc., through the categories of map making that emerged in the long 16th century. That is the co categories that were used to understand the European framing of the world. So take, for example, Asia. Uh, many people here may have heritages from Asia, and we know that in a, what is called Asia, there were three major complexes which have a long written tradition, so we can trace back their writing. And some of the writing goes back up to 6,000 years ago, uh, 5,000 years, 4,000 years. And most of these uh, main sort of literature complexes were organized where what is now Iraq, what is now Pakistan, and what is now China. And if you go back in time and you look through their archives and you through, look through their historical records, they do not have a category of Asia. They do not think that we people who live by the Yang banks of the um, Yangtze, or we who live by the banks of the Indus, or we who live by the banks of the um, Euphrates, we are, there is something common to us. The category of Asia is actually a European category. It's not a category of those people. And in fact, Asia only begins to appear and be used um, around about the mid 19th century in many ways. Similarly, Africa. Africa is drawn in a particular way in relation to European understanding about it and don't even get me started on the Americas, yeah? So in all of these cases, what you see, even the way we understand and think of the shapes of these land masses, which most humans inhabit, we see them through categories, which are part of that European exercise in world making, which is not simply drawing the maps of the world, but drawing the maps of the world and then reorganizing the world according to the maps that have been drawn. And that is actually the critical element of this Eurocentric knowledge and critical element in how we understand the present. So religion in that sense is part of that Eurocentric world making. It is a category which does a particular type of work and based on particular traditions and when it's applied outside, in different situations, it doesn't always fit. And when it doesn't fit, there are a number of choices. When European power was strong enough, 
if it didn't fit, it was hammered into shape. You know, um, people say you can't put a round peg in a square hole. Well, you can if you push hard enough. If you have enough power, you can hammer it in. But of course, in that act of hammering, you carry damage, both the hole and the peg. But when you don't have that power, when you don't have that strength, you're not going to be able to do that. And in which case, problems begin to arise. And these problems are not just one way, they're problems of understanding, and the problems of understanding produce other problems of coping. Can we go to the next slide? So, what I'm trying to describe here is something that perhaps um, we could take from the, um, this quote from Ibn Khaldun. Um, I'll leave it for a minute or two for people to read. So, Ibn Khaldun is writing this in the, um, well, in the sort of towards the middle of the 13th, um, 12th century. And what he's doing is raising a question, which I think any people of the global south would understand. The argument here he's making is this, that the vanquished want to imitate the victor. In some ways, what you could say he's describing a very early effort of what colonialism began to be, that colonization wasn't, colonization is not just simply a movement of um, the capture of territory, it is also the capture of the mind. It has a mental as well as a territorial aspect, or, or it has an epistemological as well as an economic aspect. So in a sense, what we're trying to, what I've been trying to say with um, things about the map and category of religion is really that these categories, these ways of understanding the world, these concepts are the ones which color how we understand reality around us, how we understand these. And the problems we face are as much problems of using the wrong concepts to try and understand the current situation in the world. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Now, this is a famous quote by Audre Lorde, and um, she makes the point that if you're talking about these concepts that we are all working with, we cannot necessarily use them to dismantle the master's house, which means that these concepts will not bring up radical or genuine change. Now, uh, in many ways, this seems to be quite persuasive. However, the challenge that I have is what is it that we understand as the master's house? Or more importantly, what are the master's tools? How do we understand whether one tool belongs to the master or one tool doesn't? If humans use tools, uh, mental tools, conceptual tools to understand the world and the world around us, then how do we know which tool belongs to who? Okay, so let me sort of um, address this by asking you to reflect a little bit on the way in which 
we understand what Islam is. Can we go to the next slide for a minute, please? This is a quote used by uh, Muhammad Iqbal in his Reconstructions of Religious Thought. And I think if you're a person who, um, if you're a Muslim or, or you under, how understand or empathize with something of the Muslimness, think about this. So the idea is very simple. The prophet ascends the highest heaven and returns. How many of us, if we had that honor, would ever return? It is only because the Prophet returns that, in a sense, Islam begins. Islam begins to be a transformation. And Iqbal himself talks about the difference between being a mystic and the difference between being a mystic and being prophetic. Because in the end, a mystic is someone who wants to transform themselves. Or whereas the prophetic is someone who wants to transform themselves and their society around them, which means you engage with the world as it is. So let's think about that in relation to Islam. There are a number of ways Islam is talked about. Um, People talk about Islam as a global actor. So you often hear the phrase saying Islam does this or Islam doesn't do that. Or sometimes people think of Islam as a set of regulations, which is to do with Islam doesn't permit this or Islam doesn't permit that. You often hear the phrase um, Islam is a religion of peace. Um, again, and you hear the opposite phrase Islam is a death cult. All of these things are really about what Islam is. And they're trying to sort of come to terms with what it is. What I would suggest to you is that perhaps what we need to think about is not so much what Islam is, but really we need to think about the Islamicate. What I mean by the Islamicate it's an expression taken by a scholar who used to work in Chicago, Marshall Hodgson. And he described the Islamicate as all the kind of, um, whatever is inspired by Islam, but is not reducible to Islam. So for example, you can have Islamicate uh, built architecture but it's not really architecture which is derived from the Quran per se or from the Sunnah or the Hadith, etc. It is something which is inspired by, but not reducible to. So one way to think about the Islamicate is really the space between Islam and Muslims. It is how Muslims navigate that gap between themselves and Islam. So if a Muslim understanding of Islam remains contested because on the one hand there's an attempt to reduce it to a religion which is patterned on uh, Christianity as a template and on the other there's an attempt to understand Islam as something which goes beyond a religion. In a very simple way we all kind of know when we think about Islam that Islam always exceeds whatever we think about it. To give you a very banal example, if I said to you, is someone a Muslim, or how Muslim are they if they say their prayers but um, cheat on their taxes? We would all be able to say, yes, they are. There's a Muslimness there, but we all know people like that. And there's always a demand for us to be, have these super Muslims who, um, who are consistent with our vision of what Islam would be. Many of us would say, yes, we are bad Muslims. Um, we want to be better Muslims, but also at the same time would say, yeah, Islam is good, Muslims are bad. It is easy for us to make these kinds of judgments because Islam is the name that transcends 
um, any particular manifestation of it by any particular Muslim. So in a sense, the crisis of Islam from, is really not a crisis of Islam as this um, ideal, but it is a crisis which is to do with how Muslims are able to be fit into an increasingly hostile world. Okay, let me um, pause here for a second and just try and pull some of these strings together. The project of decolonization that people often talk about now, um, which is something that um, grew, has emerged in the last 20 years, recognizes that the world we live in was made in Europe and was made probably sometime in the long 16th century. And almost all the categories and all the concepts and all the maps that we use are were made in that, uh, made by Europe, and they're used by Europeans and non-Europeans. So that's the first part of this. This is a kind of colonial inheritance that we all have. One of those categories that emerges made by Europe is um, the category of religion. And think of religion as this kind of round hole, which all these other 14 other sort of called, which are called world religions, are to try to fit them into that. But religion already carries with it a particular shape, a Christian kind of shape. And therefore to make others fit into this category, like Islam, means doing violence to Islam. In every single instance of attempting to reform Islam, um, always, always involves controlling Islam and cutting it off from the rest of the Ummah. It's always a nationalization of Islam. So Macron and de Gaulle and Mustafa Kemal and Mohammed bin Zaman, all of these people and many, many others, when they talk about Islam and trying to reform it, what they often mean is its nationalization. They mean that it should be controlled and regulated within the authority of the state one country. And the difficulty for them is always that Islam is, exceeds the boundaries of any country. This means that the category of religion and the colonial knowledge that says religion belongs, should be inside a country, and is, if Islam is to be a religion, it needs to be like this was always going to be a challenge. It's always going to create a certain amount of friction. But this friction is not to do with the character of Islam per se or Muslims as so much. It is also to do with the way in which we see the world by these Eurocentric categories. And these Eurocentric categories are now more and more, uh, finding more and more difficult to understand how the world works. And the reason for this is that we no longer live in a world dominated unquestionably by the European enterprise. We live increasingly in a post-Western age. And this is not simply because of the rise of um, China, et cetera, there's an aspect of it. It is also to do with the fact that the idea that the future of the world would be westernization has become uncontested. So things, the idea that history would get better and better and the West knew best has after the Holocaust, after ecological degradation, after colonialism, after all those horrors, it is becoming more and more difficult to make that argument that West knows best. Yeah, um, I'll give you a very small example of this. During this um, never ending electoral saga um, on day two of this uh, soap opera in the United States when the election is being decided, the State Department sent a 
uh, official communique to Ivory Coast demanding that the government of the Ivory Coast respect democratic norms and follow democratic procedures. At the same time as the President of the United States was talking about how he had been cheated out of an election. Think about this for a minute. Here we have a situation in which this is not just hypocrisy, it is actually a complete rupture with reality in a sense that um, you have the machinery of uh, white governance, which still says that it can tell the world what to do and it can be a message to the rest of the world. And then you have its sordid realities, which people see more and more. So in a sense, what you have in this moment is just a small illustration of the post-Western. Now, the post-Western means that we need to rethink about some of our conceptual tools, some of the uh, ways that we understand this world, because there is no longer the power to shape the world to a Western template. And in that tension where it is no longer possible for the West to make the world in its own image, you have had the emergence for a variety of reasons of something called Muslims. Um, you know, between let's say 1924 to probably around about 1979, there really weren't any Muslims on this planet. And before you uh, get angry with me for talking, being saying something so outrageous, almost Trumpian in simplicity, um, let me try and make myself clear. If you look at the idea of what it meant to be a Muslim, it was being under attack because the idea was that a Muslim was, or Muslim Islam was, simply a religion which was confined into uh, people's, uh, like anything else, that you may have done it on holidays, you may do it privately, but it didn't have any public function. Look at all the kind of so-called post-colonial regimes. Nearly all of them had um, various attempts to construct their societies according to a national ethnic um, paradigm um, in which Islam was ornamental or displaced. The clearest example of that, of course, is Mustafa Kemal's reforms um, culminating, you know, starting with the abolition of the caliphate in 1934, but the introduction of a Roman alphabet, all sorts of things, the uh, make moving the holiday from Friday to Sunday, all of that. And he was not alone. He was followed by Reza Shah in Iran and basically most of the post-colonial, the independent elites of, um, of Muslim societies use that as a template um, to reconstruct the societies. So what we have then is an attempt to make Islam more like a Western understanding of religion. Since then, you've had a transformation of that project. The post-Western has kicked in and it becomes more and more difficult to convince Muslims that the West knows best. So right now we are at the point in which Muslims are too strong to be ignored, but too weak to be accommodated. As a consequence, these tensions occur in which there's an attempt to try and bring them back to a template which cannot be, which they resist, which is out of time. And in these tensions, the crisis of Islam is not a crisis of Islam or a crisis of Muslim or a crisis of theology. It names a political problem. And the problem is this, that as more in, uh, as a quarter of the world's population to fifth of the world's population call themselves Muslims, they want that Muslimness to mean something to the world. It has to mean something how we understand themselves, how we understand religion, how we understand things. And in that ch change, in that kind of conflict between these different visions of a world which is pluriversal, in which Islam and Muslims and others have an ability to talk 
to try and transform it. And a world which reverts back to the idea of the West knows best. That is where we are now. And that is why we need to start thinking about those concepts that we've inherited from the colonial Eurocentric tradition and see whether they still are fit for purpose. I think I'll stop there. And I'm more than happy to take any questions if, and if there are any. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sayed, for that uh, rich discourse, um, a, a nice introduction for many uh, of us who haven't really been introduced to um, the, the discourses of decoloniality or critical Muslim studies uh, more broadly. Um, so we are opening up for questions. In the meantime, I have a, a couple of my, uh, from myself, that you know we can use just to kind of um, get things started here. Um, sure. And it actually has to do with uh, Dar al Qasim, the institute that um, you know uh, is uh, you know supporting this talk right now. Um, I think it's very fitting that uh, a, a discussion on decoloniality is happening um, at Dar al Qasim because Dar al Qasim is actually um, the result of the kind of um, Islamic preservation technique by uh, Qasim Nanotwi, who was a scholar in India uh, just after the Sepoy Rebellion and decided to start an educational project there. Um, and so it's a type of decolonial endeavor um, in traditional classical learning. Um, so my question there is for, for students um, at places like Dar al Qasim who um, you know, are, are very much in this Eurocentric um, world filled with categories that are developed uh, from the long 16th century until now, um, but who have a kind of traditional learning. Um, what, what benefit might cr uh, critical Muslim studies have for those type of persons in the sense that um, because they already live an alternate type of form of life or a different form of life from the more dominant Eurocentric um, life or they read different texts. Um, what, what addition could critical Muslim studies have for them? Thank you for, for, for that question. I think it's a really, really important um, question. And um, I want to say two things. Firstly, I want to say things slightly like provocative and then I'll try and um, make good on that. Let me uh, give you an ex um, understanding of something to do with um, the construction of knowledge. When you look at um, pre-colonial Muslim educational systems, let's talk about that. You will note that the difference between what is considered to be religious, what would, religious knowledge and non-religious knowledge, it doesn't really exist in a sense that, you know, it's not very strong. And you will see that many of the kind of figures who people, who many European Orientalists would call philosophers are also judges and jadis and making ju judgments and very, very bad, you know, Imam Ghazali and others, you can make that difference, right? So you have a kind of a unified pattern of knowledge, okay? One of the things that the colonial intervention in, 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 in for example, in India, but also in North Africa under the French did, was basically um, destroy these institutes of um, indigenous knowledge formation. And they destroyed them sometimes literally, <laughs> I mean, you know, but they're killed. Um, all they did is build out a kind of a bifraction to remove them from what, um, any kind of knowledge formation which wasn't very narrowly confined, in which the, what they were using was the framework of religion in a way which was alien to Islam and to say, well, actually, if you want to be a religious scholar, then you just look at these theological texts, but you don't just go uh, look at uh, astronomy, for example. You don't deal with um, other kinds of thinking. You don't deal with uh, questions of administration. You don't deal with, so the range of knowledge that was legitimate was narrowed down. So one of the things that critical Muslim studies wants to do 
is say two things. Firstly, let us not do, Muslims never did Islamic studies. And too often, even among the kind of, let's say, more traditional settings, the framing of what is considered to be legitimate knowledge now is basically Islamic studies done by Muslims rather than Islamic studies done by non-Muslims. But it is still within that narrow framework of what is Islamic studies. So that's one of the things that I would um, want to suggest is this, that the broadening of the decolonizing of the curriculum of the, um, uh, you know, um, kind of, let's say, conventional Muslim scholarship is important simply because we then internalize the Orientalist reading of the Islam and the Islamic hate. And that I think is really one of the most important things that I could say that we would need to broaden that. And then we would escape from one of the tendencies is this, that to say that somehow the, um, our understanding has to be frozen in relation to what has gone on and is going on and on. And that's a certain kind of lack of confidence. So I would like to see a decolonization and a recognition of the colonial imprint by confining classical, let's say traditional Islamic knowledge to places where it never was confined in a sense. And doesn't mean they didn't exist or there, but it was always more than that. If you look at the great kind of uh, interpreters and the great jurists and the great writers and commentators on the Sunnah, none, they all have day jobs. They all are involved in many other things. That's right. And I mean, all, that you're speaking something about the, the secularization um, of, of knowledge in a way that, that knowledge becomes secular through a type of um, power discourse, right? Because Christianity has views, religion, and secular life in, in that vein. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a rich remark. Thank you very much for that. We have a, a question here um, by Anwar. He says, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, please, can you compare and contrast? Uh, this might be a presentation on its own. Please, can you compare and contrast the decolonization of Franz Fanon and decolonization uh, of the, the Islamic age? Um, that's a really, really interesting question. As, um, I'm sure that the, um, um, the questioner perhaps already knows that um, Fanon is a key figure for a lot of decolonial thinking. And one of the projects of critical Muslim studies is to sort of help deorientalize decolonial thinking. Uh, because one of the things about Fanon is really, really interesting is that it clearly is an anti-colonial figure. But, and when he's writing in Algeria at the height of the um, French uh, campaigns of torture and repression in Algeria. I mean, let's not forget the French killed one million Algerians out of a population of about 10 million to try and hold on to Algeria. So when they talk about the violence of Islam, you've got to put that in context a little bit. Yeah, I would say killing one million people is pretty violent. Um, introducing electronic torture, you know, is pretty violent. But anyway, you set me aside on this one. One of the remarkable things has been that um, Fanon doesn't see any Muslims in Algeria. And what I mean by that is many of the qualities that he thinks about, which is a bit uh, gives the Algerians the ability to resist the French, et cetera, et cetera. He doesn't locate them as being part of Islam. He says they're part of their folk tradition. It's part of their, um, uh, uh, you know, the people of the country, they're always like this, which is true, but that is already Islamic kit. When they make those kinds of resistances, when they do those kinds of things, that is Islam. So one of the problems with uh, Bannon, and I think it's a problem that could, uh, was inherited by the um, ruling, um, uh, you know, the, the ruling regimes in Algeria, was a very secularist understanding of even resistance. Yeah. So go back to the point that before, the idea that was that Islam was a, was a religion. Religions are opium of the people. They're really retrograde. There are out of time, and the only role they're playing is to um, make it difficult to bring modernization. That was it. There was no concept of alternative 
kinds of modernization. No concept that Islam could generate something progressive. No understanding that if you were a, a, a person or who was a minority or a vulnerable person and from the seventh century till about the 18th century or the 19th century before the Atlantic revolutions, if you wanted to live anywhere in the world safely, you are better off living under Muslim rule, all other things being considered. Um, this is the opinion of someone like Richard Bulliet. This is the opinion of, you know, Jim Carl Frankel. So it's not just a Muslim apologist thing. Everything was, and it's not a romantic thing, but it's to recognize that there was an independent legal tradition, like any other legal tradition, you know, there was corruption and all sorts of things and, you know, but it was still there. So I think what I would say in this relation to um, the Fanon and decolonization of the Muslim world is that many, many people like Fanon and many of them have left. And one of the biggest tragedies of um, the Islamosphere is the left was so Eurocentric by and large. And as a result, they wanted to accelerate the process of secularization before they could bring about social justice. And as a consequence, they often were irrelevant to the conversation that Muslims were having. And that's been a detriment to both the left projects and to the Muslims in those societies as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, other questions? Um, So, um, so this is um, okay. This is from Hamza. He's saying, uh, "Assalamu alaikum." Practically speaking, how could we decolonize education, and who should be doing it, or who should be taking the lead? Hamza, you should be taking the lead. If you can ask the question, you can take the lead. Don't wait for people to take, give you the lead in there. Practically speaking, you can do many, many things. One thing you can do practically, and I think it's something that I would really encourage, is let our Muslim education, for example, be post Musbi. Um, often now you have a situation in which you don't, you take the boundaries of madads as being far more strict than they were. And there is an issue about why not have an education which looks across the thing. The question, let your education be post-national. Um, post Don't reproduce national work against those kind of national kind of readings within that kind of education. And to some extent, Muslims can do that much more easily. But there is still the case in which how our circulation become more umatically conscious. I mean, be aware. If you are from, most Muslims on this planet come from a South Asian context now. It's just a practical demography. Yeah. Or it is more incumbent upon them to make them um, to make themselves more knowledgeable, know about the Muslim traditions in Timbuktu, know about Muslims in South America, know about the Muslims in Cam in Vietnam. So there's a known Muslims in Tatar. So that, in a sense, just even broadening our horizons of the way in Muslimness is expressed. And doing it in a way by not looking everywhere you find a Muslim who's not like you, you start about saying they're not a proper Muslim. That's not a good way to start. So I think part of the education thing is to actually recognize globality and the scope of Islam and to not be linked, locked into our these kind of national ethnic filters. Um, and that's really, really important. Um, so I think who should do it? it becomes a question of really, we should all do it. And taking the lead is also not something, don't wait for someone to take the lead, take the lead yourself, demand that. What are you gonna to do to read across the, um, what are you gonna to do to try and learn about things which are outside that kind of um, tradition? Um, how does decolonization compare to the Islam Islamization project projects from such as Ismail Faruqi or Sayyid Naqib al -Attas? This is a really um, complicated question, and it's a good question, and I, I keep getting asked it. 
<laughs> I can't really talk about decolonization here because I think the question is really about critical Muslim studies and the Islamization of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. So there are three ways in which um, it differs. Um, firstly, is that the model of knowledge that critical Muslim studies has is not positivist. That makes a huge difference because the, I would argue with all due respect, and this is some, I think, you know, say Nafiyani and Ismail for fantastic work and powerful work, but they remain within the kind of positivist framing. And positivism is anti-historical. So I think it's really, really imp important. Um, we need to, that's one of the biggest differences. Um, the second difference, of course, is that um, because it's not positivist, it means that the idea of recovering knowledge is not the key for it. It's actually on reworking of knowledge in a way, in the way I'm trying to, to reframing it. That's what I think it's going on. So the idea of Islamization of knowledge depends on having a very clear idea of what, is, what that would mean. So what would Islamization of mathematics mean, for example? Mm -hmm. I, critical Muslim studies is less, um, less certain because in the end all knowledge is from God. It's a question about not necessarily Islamicizing knowledge but allowing us not to be inframed by the Eurocentricism and let that things go forward than rather than trying to police what the knowledge will be produced. That's one way of putting it. Okay. Um, there's a, a, a remark here by Hamza who says, uh, as a former student of Al-Azhar University, that he experienced Islam, Islam be, being explained with nationalist agendas. So yeah, I think he's... Well, that's, thank you. I mean, yeah, and I think that's an experience that many, many um, Muslims of good conscience would, if they stopped for a minute, would recognize that. And sometimes it's very light um, and almost funny, but other times it's actually quite problematic, I would argue. Yeah. Um, we are over the hour. Can you spare 10 more minutes? Be, uh, sure, if people want me to. I mean, if, yeah, you, if you can spare the time. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, I think this one, uh, how would you advise us to integrate traditional Islamic studies and the and secular knowledge? Um, uh, you may have touched on that. Okay, one... Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just say very, very quickly, one thing I would do, or two things. One, stop making the distinction between secular and traditional Islamic. That I think is very important. And two, broaden the range of things that you want to bring um, understanding to. Um, and it should not be in terms of applying traditional knowledge to secular problems, but rethinking that boundary. That's what I think we should be doing. Um, okay, so uh, about critiquing dominant discourses. Uh, so traditional Muslims uh, would, prob would probably find the idea of, of uh, dismantling uh, Eurocentrism as appealing. Um, but what if Islam uh, kind of is viewed as that dominant, not dominating, but a dominant discourse? Is there then not a type of slippery slope or a worry that such Western formulated power discourses could be weaponized against Islam and Muslims by, by colonized Muslims. Um, in this sense, I'm, I'm using the idea of uh, the, uh, the idea that one can be colonized as a positionality uh, as mm. Ross Hugo refers to it. So it's not geographically bounded. Sure. Look, I'm always wary about slippery slopes um, arguments because I think being human is being basically on one big slippery slope and just trying to hang on to doing the right thing whenever you can. Um, I mean, I think that's just the human condition in a way. Okay, so secondly, I don't think there's any 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 way of stopping weaponization of anything. Muslims can find very cunning ways of weaponizing anything they want to. However, that is not a reason for not doing the, um, what we needs to be done. Also, I don't think Muslims should worry so much about the weaponization of um, decolonial to attack Muslims. It's not that Muslims haven't been attacked um, over time, over, you know, and it's not that they haven't survived. 
So the issue is this, that we shouldn't be so, um, so kind of vulnerable in a sense. Uh, the attempts to eradicate Islam have been many. Um, many, many Muslims have experienced them. If you look at, for example, the um, in, um, African American populations, one third of them were Muslims, to half of them were Muslims. And they were gone through the horrendous and hideous process of D through enslavement, through de-Islamicization. Muslims in um, the Iberian Peninsula were de-Islamicized, expelled of the communist regimes, of the colonialist regimes, of the, um, you know, what's happened to genocide in Bosnia, etc. Uh, you can go back into history, the, you know, the Hulgai Khan burning down Baghdad. So the attacks on Muslimness have been there, but in a sense, Muslims are still standing. So I think on the range of things, um, do Hulga Khan versus decoloniality, I don't think it's, you need to lose sleep on it. That's the first thing. But the real issue is this, that I don't think it is, makes sense to think about decoloniality and power in the same way for, for um, outside European experience. Coloniality is a very specific project. It is not the same as the Roman Empire. It's not the same as every other single empire. Because, the bound, because one of the things which is distinctive about coloniality is the racialization logic. So none of the, um, I think that's sometimes forgotten. We tend to go to talk about Eurocentricism means that we end up treating every exercise of power, every exercise of um, authority as being European. And we just say, well, actually it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. Because power is not only prohibitive, it's not something that stops things, it's also productive. Yes. If you think you want to live powerlessly, ask the people, in Muslims in Kashmir, or Palestine, or in Burma, or in East Africa, what does it mean to live powerlessly? And then you tell me that that's uh, what you want for yourself. So the question isn't about power, per se, it's the configuration of power, it's different ways of configuring power. And I think that's what we have to remember that, um, so decoloniality at its most productive isn't about being against power because being against power means that you are for the present distribution of power. That's what you are saying, practicality. What it means is thinking about a different configuration which allows emancipation which allows the reduction in cruelty. That's, and that can, I do not know, I cannot imagine how this can be done without uh, creating a, a countervailing exercise of power. Okay, yeah, right. So power is always going to be there, even through silent permissions, um, as, as Skinner might yeah. say. Yeah. Um, this is a interesting one. So what, what would you say to those who say that decolonial work is merely a response to inferiority complex? Um, I would say to them, what do you actually mean by that? Why is it, a, I would argue it's actually the opposite. Decolonial work is not a response to inferiority complex, it's the refusal to have internalize an inferiority complex. That's what I would say if I was asked. Um, okay. So um, I, I don't see one and then perhaps maybe I could ask the last question if that's all right. Sure, um, of course. Like we went through the chat, okay. Um, and, and this has to do with the remark really with uh, the relationship of the colonial knowledge and the Western Westernized Academy. I mean, it comes from a remark from Nelson Maldonado Torres, who said that people of color, and here I'd like to say maybe black and brown bodies, cannot mm -hmm. possibly put modernity, philosophy, or the humanities in crisis, end quote. Um, so could you speak, so I'll say that again. So he says, quote, people of color cannot possibly put modernity, philosophy, or the humanities in crisis. Um, and he's, he's saying that this is the perception from many philosophy departments who exhibit a type of 
racist logic. Um, so could you speak about um, that in relation to your work um, and um, critical Muslim studies in general? Like, can it pierce uh, what Torres says is, um, you know, power will not permit? Yeah, the thing with Nelson is that he keeps asking permission. And if you keep asking permission, then you're already allowing power to dictate these things. I think this is, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of the way that knowledge production works. And it may come to different kinds of experiences. So take something very simple. Once upon a time, astrology, about 150 years ago, was considered to be a major sort of discipline. Um, it was very, and, and it was and it led on, you know, people had astrology departments, etc. Now, if you think about astrology and astronomy, they're two different things. Astrology is what you get on newspapers and magazines and things like that, tell you about your horoscope, and astronomy is which gets the big science and tries to map out the um, cosmos, right? So, in a way, what you have is disciplines come and go, and then they disappear. So, one argument about Islamic studies is that, as I've said before. Let's be clear when Islamic studies begins. Islamic studies does not begin with Muslims. It begins with colonial construction of knowledge of Islam and its curtailment into a particular sphere. And it happens at a moment when Muslims are unable politically, geopolitically, to exercise that uh, autonomy to construct knowledge for themselves and for their needs, right? So and at the end of the day, I'm not particularly interested in what, um, you know, these uh, philosophers may say or not say. I think if Muslims stop paying attention to them and do our own thing, they will follow us. They want to study Muslims. And if Muslims are not studying them, that's their problem. It's not our problem. So I think we should worry about them not giving permission. In fact, I would be worried if they gave permission because it would mean that it wouldn't, it wouldn't mean anything. It would be a, wouldn't be a challenge. It's a bit like how um, corporate America becomes really, really good at being translating any protests into commercials for soft drinks or wearing the kind of color so that, you know, they can proclaim it at the same time, not too far kind of thing, yeah? yeah. So the point is it's kind of decaffeination of all of that. So I think, um, you know, whether, I have no illusions that critical Muslim studies um, will be challenged and continue to be challenged, but that's not the audience. In the end, critical Muslim studies will be will succeed if it is helpful to its project of Muslims, but also all those who are outside the pale of the West. Those that's what it opens the door for. And that's what it cares. And in the end, you know, look, they don't invite you to your conferences and to your club. I mean, this is the remark that Groucho Marx made, which I think is really, I mean, you know, it's kind of, you know, I don't want to be member club that would have me of its member and in those days in the 1930s of course all good clubs would never have Jewish members yeah so there's a kind of a paradox in a sense there it is not that relevant at the end of the day we don't need benediction from that we need to do the work and if the work is helpful for communities of the dispossessed throughout the planet alhamdulillah that's good enough for me yeah, and I, I think very much that's why uh, Daryl Qasim is so uh, insistent on um, building its own institution with uh, an, an interesting mix of um, traditionally trained scholars and, um, you know, PhD graduates, all who are kind of teaching together, who don't really secularize knowledge in, in, in different ways. So, I, uh, and, and being kind of distinct from the Westernized University, I think they want to be able to to speak um, for themselves. Well, you have the examples of the historical black college in the United States. I mean, in a sense that, you know, they always exist in a different universe. It's yeah. a higher education apartheid in a way. But again, they're not that different in terms of the kind of initial attempts to create spaces for education for those who were denied education and from that different constructions of education coming in. What amazes me is that, you know, after civil rights, after all that, how they still remain outside that um, connection. You can talk about the University of Chicago or Northwestern. I know recently Northwestern was, um, there was a attempt to um, have stronger links with HBCUs and things like that. But you would think they might have, you know, 
why do we have that? So in a way, it's, it's, it, it speaks to that possibility that this is why Donald Carson and other movements for decolonial knowledge is, um, you know, doing this kind of critical Muslim studies work is, I, I think, really, really important. And in the end, because the work is important. That's right. That's what it comes down to. Okay, well, we're out of time uh, with, with Professor Salman Sayed. Um, this was a, a rich discussion. Thank you, at least for my, myself, and I hope for those of you who are in attendance. Um, please uh, visit uh, Dawa Qasim's website, as well as uh, Professor Salman Sayed's uh, two books, uh, Recalling the Caliphate um, and um, uh, A Fundamental Fear. Fundamental fear. Both are wonderful texts uh, that you can consider looking at to have a greater exposition of, of his work. And of course, visit the uh, Pluto journals for uh, a, a kind of closer examination of what critical Muslim studies is about and decoloniality in general. And listen to the network reorient podcasts. Right. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Well, Jazakallah Khair, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sayed. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was great. And maybe we'll, we'll have you sometime in Chicago in the future. Inshallah, whenever. Whenever the COVID's over. <laughs> thank you. So, 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 so